Hello again, Neil Petrie with Free and Equal. Got a question for you. Partition or integration? In August of 1947, the partition of British India led to the creation of a Hindu majority India and the Muslim majority Islamic Republic of Pakistan. Partition was required because of the complete breakdown of relations between the major religious communities. The friction was not of recent origin and predated the Raj with conflicts reaching back to the 7th century and the first Muslim incursions, culminating in the subjugation of the vast majority of Hindus by the Muslim Mughals, almost a thousand years later. Interestingly, one of the most insightful works on the creation of the new states was written before the event. In 1945, Dr. B. R. Ambedkar published Pakistan or the Partition of India in which he addressed why and how separate Muslim majority and Hindu majority states might come about. This is no lightweight polemic, as Ambedkar would go on to serve in the cabinet of the newly independent nation as India's first law and justice minister. His book is the result of a first-rate mind, highly trained as a legal and economic scholar, and Ambedkar had risen astonishingly from the ranks of those then referred to as untouchables, today the Dalits. When he wrote Partition, he was already well known in India for an earlier book attacking Hinduism, Annihilation of Caste, and he would later convert to Buddhism. Clearly, he was no apologist for Hindus, and was possibly as objective and informed a homegrown observer as one might find in the subcontinent at the time. His prescient book on the partition is worth studying as events across the UK and Europe reflect some of the issues he identified. In recent times, politicians such as Angela Merkel and David Cameron have noted the failure of multiculturalism and Dr Ambedkar's thoughts on the then future of the subcontinent suggest it is worthwhile looking ahead to Britain's too. At the time that he wrote the book, many Hindus hoped and believed that India could remain whole, with Gandhi leading the troop as a vocal supporter of a single state. Dr Ambedkar was not so sure. As Ambedkar noted, in depending upon certain common features of Hindu and Mohammedan social life, in relying upon common language, common race and common country, the Hindu is mistaking what is accidental and superficial for what is essential and fundamental. The political and religious antagonisms divide the Hindus and the Muslims far more deeply than the so-called common things are able to bind them together. Not much comfort there then. However, many senior politicians live in a global bubble and tend to ignore thinking if it does not align with their rarefied visions. But between Gandhi and Ambedkar, who proved right? Dr Ambedkar also noted that when it came to making and satisfying demands, again he states, as against the Hindus, the Muslims somehow always succeed. This success may be attributable to the commitment of Muslims to the faith, something bolstered by the apostasy laws that require execution of those reneging on the religion. Maybe this goes some way to explaining the maintenance of their numbers, their steadfastness and their cohesion. Today, execution sits on the statute books of 11 Islamic nations, indicating the power that 7th century mores still hold over Muslim communities. When he peered into India's future, Dr Ambedkar saw how the right to self-determination would be a difficult issue to deal with something our government may soon face as it tries to hold our communities together. The one-time Indian cabinet minister noted, The danger to a mixed and composite state, therefore, lies not so much in external aggression as in the internal resurgence of nationalities which are fragmented, entrapped, suppressed and held against their will. Those who oppose Pakistan should not only bear the danger in mind, but should also realise that the attempt on the part of suppressed um, nationalities to disrupt a mixed state and to found a separate home for themselves, instead of being condemned,
finds ethical justification from the principle of self-determination. So, on the basis of self-determination, if large enough communities of Muslims in England or Europe decide to secede to enjoy the benefits as they see them of Sharia, who can stop them? Not only that, maybe several new states could appear, as East and West Pakistan did. Though Bangladesh eventually broke away from West Pakistan in a bloody conflict, with many of the casualties being from the vulnerable and despised Hindu minority, their death toll reported as running into the hundreds of thousands, maybe millions. Whilst partition happened in a country in which Muslims had lived for many hundreds of years, in the West this is not the case. After Luther began the Reformation in 1517, Europe had a long period of religious strife that eventually ended with freedom of belief being accepted across the continent, if grudgingly in some places. However, Protestant states still paid dues to the Catholic Habsburgs to fund them in their confrontation with Islamic forces to the south. Today, with Islam's apostasy laws being unacceptable in this continent, how will secession by relatively recently arrived Muslims to form a Sharia compliant state be viewed? Will the right to self-determination trump the West's adherence to freedom of conscience in the lands in which this foundation of liberty was so bloodily built? If Islam is not reformed and it retains the death penalty, often threatened and sometimes carried out extra-legally, will Europeans submit and allow significant Muslim communities to secede? Will Sharia jurists and new national groups terrorise recalcitrant followers, maybe executing a few to keep the community together? You are in a particular situation in which you have to live like a state within a state till you take over. But until this happens, you have to pray. Or you become in such a force that the people, they just, just submit to you. Hands up. Till you become strong enough that to take over. From watching videos of radical British Muslims on YouTube, this would appear to be exactly what some devout jurists, the faithful leaders and guides of the community wish to do. The famous philosopher of science and society, Karl Popper, spoke of the paradox of tolerance, noting that unlimited tolerance will destroy tolerance and probably take the tolerant society with it. This thinking formed part of the foundations of what we, or he, defined as the open society, which until recently was how the West largely defined itself. He went so far as to say, we should consider incitement to intolerance and persecution as criminal, in the same way as we should consider incitement to murder, or to kidnapping, or to the revival of the slave trade as criminal. Secession, for example, of the most heavily Muslim populated parts of maybe Lancashire or Yorkshire, Birmingham or London, will require those non-Muslims unable to move, for a variety of reasons, to submit to partition. But apostates will have to move out, along with the non-believers wishing to avoid Sharia in any new Muslim majority state or states. As Christian Pakistanis and Hindu Bangladeshis can tell you, selling up and moving out may not be a bad idea. Dr. Ambedkar predicted their fate in 1945. As he said, for Islam divides as inexorably as it binds. Islam is a close corporation and the distinction that it makes between Muslims and non-Muslims is a very real, very positive and very alienating distinction. The Brotherhood of Islam is not the universal Brotherhood of Man. It is the brotherhood of Muslims for Muslims only. Today we can look to a more recent example, the 2011 creation of a largely Christian South Sudan. This new state was separated off as a means for the non-Muslims to escape decades of Sharia enforcement by murderous Janjaweed militia, working at the behest of the Muslim Arab Northerners. In the Philippines, Muslim separatists in Mindanao have won some autonomy from the state and are internationally recognised by the 57 state organisation of Islamic cooperation. So is the UK a future candidate for secession or secessions? In 2021, Ed Hussein, a former Muslim radical,
published the findings of his investigation into Islam in the UK. He wrote in Among the Mosques that after travelling the length and breadth of Great Britain, meeting Muslims from every major denomination, it is clear to me that blind reliance on scripture and clerics is overwhelmingly strong within British Islam. One of the moderate sheikhs he met said that the vast majority of mosques and organisations in British Islam are a huge problem. There, I've said it. His words. Hussein noted that his inquiries into the integration of his fellow Muslims had led him to conclude that Britain's shortage of inspiring Muslim role models, as Hussein says, reflects the fact that clerics and caliphists are nurturing a particular type of Islam whose ideas, values and culture are set to conflict increasingly with wider society. For too long, politicians and others have uncritically praised the Muslim contribution to British society and glossed over the challenges of integration. On the ground, reality is the opposite of what politicians say. There is growing separatism and increasing confrontation. If integration in 2021 was being neutralised by the Muslim clerics and caliphists, Hussein's report suggests that the sense of separatism will have grown, so the outlook is bleak indeed. The figures he quoted for 2020 indicated that of the nation's 43,000 terror suspects, 90% were caliphists, the result of, as he said, long decades of tolerating intolerance. Those figures from three years before last October's assault by Hamas must have been added to by January of this year, when Sky News reported there had been a 25% increase in intelligence coming into counter-terrorism police, a significant increase on our usual levels. Hussein's book was not enough of a warning to the nation's sloping shoulders politicians to spur them into action, and he saw us leaving, and he said again, ourselves open to the only other possible scenarios, social separatism, communal domination, conflict of some form, partition of towns, and ultimately mass deportations. Whilst Prime Minister Starmer may find it difficult to accept what Hussein said, one wonders what he makes of his old colleague and founder of Doughty Street Chambers, Geoffrey Robertson, King's Counsel, and the conclusions he came to over a decade ago concerning freedom of belief in Islam. This highly regarded champion of human rights and civil liberties defined apostates of Islam as victims of genocide. His 2012 book, Mullahs Without Mercy, noted that those who left the religion they were born into form part of a group protected under the Genocide Convention of 1948. Because, as he said, for the purposes of the Convention, it is clear that persons who are born into a particular faith that they later announce can be so categorised. So Muslim apostates are part of the groups protected under the Convention. Is our Prime Minister aware that 11 Muslim nations have genocidal apostasy laws on their books? Would he support a case against those imposing capital punishment on their former believers? And more importantly, as far as social cohesion in the UK is concerned anyway, Will he be considering the resident status of Islamic jurists in this country or those visiting us? Do we want anyone supporting genocidal codes to have a role as a community leader? Or visiting us to undermine our social fabric and to push for Sharia and secession? Are we to tolerate intolerance? Dr Ambedkar's prescience was not appreciated in 1945, but his unheeded work was followed two years later by partition, during which the lives of many millions were destroyed and over a million lives were lost. If we are a serious people, we should take heed, but not of our politicians. As Ed Hussein had warned, on the ground, reality is the opposite of what politicians say. He ended his disturbing book with a call to follow Popper's advice. We must not tolerate intolerance for nothing less than the future of our country depends on it. Prime Minister, 
it's your job to sort this out. So the question you face is one that you will recognise from an aptly titled work of Lenin. What is to be done? As Ed Hussein has noted, integration is less likely by the day as we have a community guided by leaders steeped in genocidal as defined by Geoffrey Robertson KC law codes. If integration does not work, will deportation or partition? That's all today from Free and Equal and Neil Petrie. See you again.